All right. We're going to be two different areas today. We're going to be the Old Testament and the New Testament. Both are verses 9 and 10. So we're going to be in John chapter 10 and then 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10 as well. So Old Testament, New Testament. I'm going to start by reading these verses to you, and then we'll say a word of prayer and we'll dive in. John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Jesus is speaking, and he has shared some stories up to this point with different people, both the religious people and the normal everyday Joe. And as he is sharing these verses, he people aren't understanding him. So he's going through and explaining them, and then he, he throws this little tidbit in there when we've talked around this before, but we haven't just dove into this last part, this very important part that's right in the middle of it. In verses 9 and 10, these are the words of Jesus, and he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So Jesus shares these words, and in these two verses, he points out so many things that are taking place, and yet the listener has to make the decision as to what they want to listen to and where it is that they are in part of the story. So last week, Jordan, who came up and shared, he ended the, the series, the Opportunity Series, which dives into this next series, which is the Game of Life. So we ended with this life chart, and we found out last week that whenever we focus on the things that we really want to focus on, the how nice our clothes are, and the kind of car we drive, and, and all the material things that the world it bogs us down at times because we're keeping up with the Joneses, and then that really is nice and shiny, and, and it's got the brand new smell, and all the things that we want to be a part of. But we find out that the things that really matter, they get squeezed in at the end, and when it comes to that in life, a lot of times we don't have the time for those important things. So he showed us how if we change our priorities around and we focus upon those first and we put those priorities in, that all those other things, we can fill them all together. So when he was done, he made the life jar and before the golf balls were all on the top, but he was able to actually seal this and keep his entire life in focus by focusing on the things that matter the most first. So in this game of life, in this game of life, how is it that we take those steps? Well, when I was younger, I was thinking about this earlier, and I was, when I was younger, we used to play board games, and board games are something that's gone now. In fact, you can buy them at a store, but for the most part, people don't play them. And the reason they don't play them is because of the technology age. Nowadays, if, if I can't get it as an app on my phone, if I can't get it on my tablet, or if I can't put it on my gaming system, there's really no sense in playing it. And because of that, what it's done is it's, it's taken kids from sitting around a table and enjoying that time together to literally putting them in front of a TV to where that's the only way that they can get that stimulation. So the games that we played when we were younger, we played Monopoly, which was a fun family game until it ended up in a fist fight. We played, you laugh now, but that's what ended up happening. You get to school, did your, kid, did your parents beat you? No, my brother hit me because he got bored walking. I'm going to park plays and then, you know, all that kind of stuff. We played spoons. How many people have ever played spoons? Spoon's a fantastic game, and it's, it's an easy game that you can play. We play different games with dice, and then we also play games with cards. I know for, for some denominations that that, I found out later, is a sin. I, I, I was actually teaching at a church that, you know, the whole, it just depicted that you were a gambler, and I taught a message using a set of playing cards, and I did a magic trick in it. And it was probably the only time in the 75 years at that time of the church that, that playing cards were ever used in a, in a message. And I was told afterward it's also going to be the last time. I got that going. So there's things that you learn about different denominations you can go through teaching. But the board games were always a lot of fun for us. So we would pull out the board games. It was different for us too because in my family, having eight kids, we never knew if the actual game itself was together. So we would pull the, the board game out. And then we'd open up, and, and, and you'd look in, and you're like, okay, let's, let's set the whole board game up. And we, we go to set the game up, and it's like, you know, I'll use Monopoly as an example. It has, we got a new game, and because nobody plays anymore, you can actually see the actual pieces. Some, someone wants to be a schnauzer, and somebody wants to be the thimble, and somebody wants to be the race car. Everybody wants to be the race car. And, uh, you know, there's all these, the top hat and all these things you don't you know, choose to be a part of the Monopoly. Well, in ours, it was, okay, um, you know, I'm going to be the code cap, you know, because you used to have... <laughs> pop with the bottle top, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, I'm going to be the, the broken toothpick. Was that, is it used? Slightly used. Okay, I'll be the broken toothpick. You know, I'm going to be the, 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 the checker. I mean, all these games would come together. Okay, and then we get out and, and you'd have two dice. Ours would be one white dice and one big fuzzy dice in my brother's car because that's all we had. They'd roll around and then the dice would go off and then fall on the ground and it's got to land. I mean, we did all those things. But we sat around the table and we enjoyed those times because there were times together to come together, and through that you look back and you laugh now, but 
We don't have those times nowadays. We don't spend that same time, and the dinner table has become nothing more than a place to collect junk and to collect all the things and to collect all the stuff, and we don't have those times where we just sit around and talk or sit around and maybe play games. And to me, that saddens me because it breaks the part of the relationships that are so much a part of our lives and those relationships that, that need to be a part of our lives. And whether it's playing a game of cards or a card game, we miss out on those. But how do, we, how do we transition that? How do we go back to focusing on these things that truly, truly matter? And how, what is this game of life that we're in? What is this, this game that we focus on every single day and yet we get so stuck in this rut and then we get back this next Sunday and we have a reminder like, oh yeah, that was a good message and yeah, I really want to live this. So I started thinking about our lives and the chapters that we have. And if you think about it, the game of life as we go, it's the responsibilities, as we get older, it's the responsibilities that take us away from actually having this game of life and enjoying it to the fullest, to having to just kind of go step by step, and all of a sudden we're back in the same rut, and got these emails, and I've got this, and all these things to focus upon. If you're a little kid, a newborn, up to one year, all that newborn has to do is eat and go to the bathroom. That's it. That's the game of life to them. Every once in a while, they'll smile a little bit. They'll make a face. Oh, my goodness, they're smiling at me. We wait for them to go to make a, a voice or a name. They'll say something for the first time. When they roll over, it's this big thing. But that little kid doesn't know. All that little kid knows is I've got to eat. I've got to go to the bathroom. That's it. That's all I have to worry about. And then one day, they start to walk. And so all of a sudden, now, their life is eat, go to the bathroom, and try not to fall and hit something. Then they get, a little bit, they get a little bit older, and all of a sudden they have to eat, they have to walk, they have to make sure they're going to the bathroom in the right spot. And then they have to get on the school bus. And then all of a sudden they, they're hit with things such as homework. And, and who, who did that? And that's part of the game of life. Then they get to middle school, and not only do they have to do homework, they're responsible for going on their own because they're saying, we don't want your parents to help you. And so now this game of life starts to get a little bit more tricky, does it? And when they're looking at this and going, this, this isn't fun. I had this discussion with my little girl a while ago because when she was in kindergarten, she had what's called half-day kindergarten. I don't know if, they, if every school does that, but at the time, that's what Manchester did. And so every day, she would come home at 12.30, and that was my lunchtime. And I would make sure that we'd have that time together. We would make tuna fish salad sandwiches together, and we would play Mario Kart Wii. And I would kick her butt. So I'm like, this is the game of life, and you're going to lose. No, I didn't. Sometimes she beat me. Every once in a while, I let her. But when we were done, we were playing the same team, and at the end, there was a little parade that you got to be a part of. So she'd sit on my lap, and we'd enjoy the parade. And then we'd go and play again. And I had to literally pull myself away after an hour to go back to the, my game of life so that she could get back to hers, which was fun and joy, and, I, and, I, and, it's, and it's great. And then first grade hit. And after about three days of first grade, she came to me, and she said, hey, when do I get to come home so that we can make tuna fish salad sandwiches and play Mario Kart Group Wii? I told her, you don't. And she looked at me, she's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, you have to go to school every day. She's like, for how long? I've been doing this for like a week now. And so I told her for about the next 12 years. And she looked at me, and her eyes started like filling with tears. She was like, can I quit school? And I looked at her, and I'm like, yeah, quit school. Let's play Mario Kart. Wouldn't it be great if we could just get to that point where... We could just play Mario Kart Wii for the rest of our lives and eat tuna fish salad. But the sound, the problem is, in our game of life, as we get older, that doesn't happen. All of a sudden, we get to, to high school, and our hair has to look a certain way, and we have to wear a certain kind of clothes. And then all of a sudden, we're starting to drive, and we've got to earn mom and dad's trust enough with the car so that we can take it to drive. And then, oh, by the way, what do you mean there's gas I have to put in it? And oh, I have to pay for that? And there's insurance, and I've got to cover that? And you're expecting me to do all these things, but I don't have a job. Oh, I have to get a job? And then we start working, and we're about a week into the job. We're like, I don't like working. This is terrible. Why don't, am I going to do this for the rest of my life? And then the song, we, we graduate from high school, and then there's that next step. And what is that next step? Is it the military? Is it going off to school? Is it literally leaving home to go to school? Is it commuting? Then we start to get into high school, and then one day we start realizing, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to make a decision about life. What am I going to do? What is the next step? What is that first job? And over and over and over, the responsibility kicks in more and more and more. And at the end of the day, basically what this comes down to is this is literally the game of life. So I pulled this out last night. Because I'm like, I want to see what's in the game of life. And anytime you start a new board game, the first thing that you have to do 
is you've got to open the game up, and then you have to read the directions. Now, my family doesn't do that. My family, what we do is we just open it up, we start setting it up, and we're sure we know everything. Yeah, I've played this before, and I know what your ruler is, and on, 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 and I've done this, and on, but you, in this game, you have to set it up, and in the, the game, you not only almost knocked your jar with that, that. In this game, you have to set it up, and there's things that you have to set up. But at some point, sometime, somebody has to read the directions. And the reason I know that is because for the first time last night, I read the directions. And I found out we've been playing it wrong for all these years. No wonder my mom and dad won every single game. But there's a spinning wheel that takes place in the spinning wheel. And you get to pick your car, you get to pick your thing that you want. And the funny thing is about this is that each car is the same. It's just a different color. Of course, that's going to lead to a fight. I want the orange one. I want the white one. I want the blue one. I want the gray one. I'm colorblind. I don't care what I have. Just give me whatever. And as you're going along, you get to fill up your own little car. It's kind of funny because these were actually, this game was made, I don't know how long ago, but these are actually minivans. I know, right? They were waiting for the, the biggest guru will be on the history of cars, but they're actually minivans. Because you have a point in time where you get to fill it up with a mom and dad and then up to four kids. You can't have more than four kids in the game of life. Anybody here have more than four kids? Well, I can't believe that one person raised their hand. Okay, then you get, you're already getting the game of life. But at some point, sometime, you start, and you have to start a career, or you get to start into college, and you have to make a choice. And the best part about this game is before you ever end up going into this game of life, you have to go over a ramp. And so you have to go up the ramp, and then down the ramp before you enter the true game of life. So as you're spinning, you start to spin. You go, okay, oh, there is 10. So I go, I'm going to start into, what do you want to start into, Aubrey? You want to start into college or career? Good choice. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, you already graduated. Move on to life. Hey, it's your life. Deal with it, all right? Here we go. 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Oh, guess what? You have to ride your bicycle to work. That's the good news. You can stay in shape. The bad news is your job is in Cleveland. <laughs> All right, we're going to roll again, Aubrey. This is your life. One, two, three, four, five. Happy honeymoon. Oh, dear Lord, you're already married. How about that? So we rolled three times, and she's already graduated from college. She is already, what, what, what was that her? She had to cycle to work back and forth to clean every day, okay? Because of the terrible traffic there, someone noticed her and said, hey, who's that little cutie riding on the bike? And hey, car ride. Her dad's like, seriously, is that how you met? Oh, yeah, we're good to go. And by the way, we're on our honeymoon. In three turns, in less than 30 seconds, Aubrey's already moving on with her life. I hope you don't have children soon, but you might. One, two, three, four, five. Payday. Payday. Oh, my goodness, payday is up. You get to have some money. We get to tie it in the show the cash, right? We're going to make it rain. But you know, it doesn't rain as much as I thought it was going to because I thought this check would be a lot bigger than what it was. And now what I do is because I can't even pay the bills. We're going to go 10 here, Aubrey. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Oh, baby girl. <laughs> Jennifer, what? <laughs> Jennifer Jr. <laughs> but that's a that's a sep that's a like a generation removed. So isn't it Jennifer Jr. Jr.? Okay, Jennifer is Jr. the middle name, or you're just gonna put a Jr. on it? It's what? J cubed. Oh, see, she had a rapper. A rapper. <laughs> what up, mom? What? Okay. <laughs> All right, three more, let's see what you go. One, two, three, twins! <laughs> Aubrey, this is your life. Listen, this is how it's going to happen exactly. This is the game of life. What are the twins' name? Bob and Jerry. Okay, so you will name someone after your mom, but if you just skip right over dad, huh? That's how it goes. It's like the athletes that go, and the dad works with them, coaching them over and over and over, and they finally get on TV in college, and the dad's like, I'm so proud. They scored a touchdown, and they go, hi, mom. <laughs> okay, um, last roll. Okay, last roll. Let's see where you go. Uh-oh, you got a big choice. You want to go right or left? Oh, you know what? You, oh, okay, that's, that's not a good one. <laughs> well, the reason it wasn't because it had to 
trade with another person and we, we don't have anyone else to trade with. So we're going to keep going. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, you, had, you were at an art auction, you bought some art, okay? And because you didn't name your kid art, you have to buy the art. You get that? All right, here we go. And you have to pay $20,000, so that not having that this week. But this is the game of life, isn't it? Maybe not the art auction, but the other things that take place. Where all of a sudden, you're this sweet, young, elementary school kid. You're this baby that's just born. And then all of a sudden, boom, you are graduating. And you're moving on to life, and you're having a daughter. And then all of a sudden you're having twins. And then you're having to pay here. And you're having to pay there. And over and over and over and over. And the next thing you know, the responsibility, the responsibility, the responsibility weighs us down so much that we have to focus on this, literally this game of life that we're in. And yet, when Jesus shared the words that he shared today, he said this. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. So in other words, when you come through me, when you enter through me, you will have this opportunity to come and go as you please. Because in eternity, you are set free. And yet in life, we don't get to come and go as we please, do we? Because tomorrow, for Aubrey, she has to wake up and she has to go to school. Now, she can skip school if she wants, but there's consequences to it. So she's going to go to school to see her friends. And they're going to be the greatest friends that she has for the next few years. And then she's going to have to make a decision because then she's going to have to go to college. Or she's going to have to go to a trade school. Or she's going to have to go to the military. And for the rest of us, it is, oh, then I have to make the decision tomorrow to get up to go to my job. And when I dive into my job, I have to make a decision as to how it is that I'm going to work today. I have to make the decision of getting my kids up for school and getting them on the school bus. I have to make the decision to go to my job or to not go to my job. I have to make the decision to go to school or to not go to school. I have to make the decision to go to that next thing because that is what life has called me to do. And yet, Jesus has shared with us that, listen, if we will rest in Him and turn to Him, we can focus on going in and out as we please because that's the promise of eternity. But we're not in eternity yet. But see, that promise for eternity starts here within this life. Because he says, he will come in and go out and find pasture. In other words, you will be fed. I will give you what it is that you need daily. And he says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. I have come that you will have life, that you will live life in such a way that you don't have to wait for eternity to come to me. You can live it now. You can be a reflection of me now with eternity in mind. You can have all those things and fit them in right into your life so that you can close that lid and know that you are living for God. And in this game of life, it doesn't have to just get down to a payday. It doesn't have to just get down to having a child or having two more or to get married or to graduate. Any of those things, they're, they're markers along the way. But do we seek God and do we see Him within those moments? Because He promises us this, that He is there. He will allow you in and out. He will give you pasture. He will fulfill those daily needs. But he stops, and he, he stops for a second in the next verse, and he shares this with us. And he says this, he, I'm sorry, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. And so there's something in there that stops us. There's something that comes in that steals from us. The intention is to kill and destroy us. And when it kills and destroys us, it kills the very dreams that we may have had when we were younger. Has Aubrey ever thought about graduating from high school? She better because it's coming up in a few months. Has she thought about those next steps? Absolutely, I'm sure that she has. But when you get to college, are you thinking about those next steps? But also stay within the day to recognize Christ within those moments. Because we go to get a degree. And then we end up in a job that we don't necessarily want. And we look back and we're like, I had these dreams. And I had these ambitions. And I had these goals. And I never wrote them down, so I don't even really remember what they were. <coughs> I just remember they were there at one point. But you know what? Now I have kids, and maybe I can help them to achieve their dreams and achieve their goals. But are they focused on this life? Because if they are, eventually the thief comes in, and he robs us, and he steals from us, and he tries to destroy us. We lose loved ones. We get a phone call we don't expect. Somebody just decides to up and leave. Someone says, I've had enough of this life, I'm going to go start a new one. We hear about things like midlife crises. 
Or we just hear about people who just say, I quit and I'm done. And Jesus shares that with us because he knows that there's someone who wants to steal from you and take from you and destroy you. And that heart that was so big, those eyes that were so open, were so wide, knew nothing else but those that loved you and cared for you, that played all day long, that enjoyed a game just to enjoy a game. And at the end of the day, if they bruised their knee, or if they fell down, or if they won, or if they got ice cream, they came to you because they knew that you <coughs> would put your arms around them and love them and care for them and allow them to come and go as they please. It's the same promise that Jesus gave to each of us. How do we do this then? How do we get through the day so that it's just not the next week and I've got 50 emails and I've got 20 appointments and I've got to make a phone call and I've got to get to a lunchtime and I've got to go to school again and I've got a science test and I've got to work 20 extra hours and over and over and over because when you talk about that way, life doesn't sound all that grand. At the same time, I'm so stuck in life mode that I don't see Christ in each and every moment. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 4? We're going to meet a man by the name of Jabez today. And Jabez, from the get-go, had everything working against him. Jabez, from the time that he was born, had life working against him. And yet he had to make a choice. Just like you have to make a choice, and I have to make a choice every single day. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, and this is the lineage that leads down to who Jesus is eventually. It leads down to David. It's literally the royal lineage, both chapter 3 and chapter 4. So a lot of people, you're going through this and you'll skip over this. This guy begat this guy, and this guy begat this guy. It was like the, the family tree thing you see, you know. My grandpa was uh, Steve, and then my daughter was Jen, and then my kids were Bob and, what were they again? Bob and Siri? Bob and Jerry. I said Bob and Siri. I'm like, don't mean your kids, Siri. So, all right, Bob and Jerry and Jen Square, right? All of a sudden you have that. But you have that family tree that goes through. This is what the first Chronicles does. So people don't really read this because I don't really care who begat who and who begat who because most of the names I can't pronounce anyway. They didn't name them Steve and Bob and Bob and Jerry and Jen, where it was easy. They named them Obadiah and Hazelpaniah and Newell and Ezra and Hushah. And I don't even know if I pronounced half those names right. I just looked down and tried to pronounce them. So verse 9 in First Chronicles uh, chapter 4 says this, Jabez was more honorable than his brother. So the first thing we find out about this guy named Jabez is that he chose to live in such a way that when people saw him, that he lived a life that was honoring to his family, because that was very important at the time, and also to God. And it says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave, I gave birth to him in pain. So we don't know what happened at this birth, but something happened so that she could say, this guy was literally, he is so much pain, he is going to bring sorrow, because he has brought me sorrow. So his mom could have died at birth, there could have been a defect that he had, there could have been something that, that he had such as a defect so that she would have to carry him or take him for the rest of her life, and then she was burdened to him. We don't know. We just know that she named him Jabez because that name means they, they brought me a ton of sorrow. But the other people in the society, whenever they see someone like this, and they see someone who has a name such as this, they're like, uh-oh, be careful that guy. Because if he has a bad name, that means he's going to have a bad life. And if he has a bad life, that's not someone you want to hang out with. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when he comes home from school, hey, who'd you bring with you today? I brought a friend. Oh, what's his name? <clears throat> his name's Jabez. Oh, Jabez. I brought that kid that brings sorrow. I'd like to bring the kid that brings pain. Okay, you guys have fun outside. They head home. And, yeah, that's the last play date you're going to have. Why? Well, he was named that for a reason. He's going to have a terrible life. And since he's named the kid of sorrow and pain, you don't want to be around that guy. You get off to college and you bring the college friend home. Hey, who'd you bring with you? I brought Jabez. Ooh, sorrow and pain, sorrow and pain. So wherever this guy goes, sorrow and pain have followed him because everyone sees that with their name. Perfect example, when you go to name a child, you don't name your kid after something corny, do you? Uh, the J squared, right? We don't do that. Like when you're naming your kid, you don't go, you know what? I'm going to name my son Avocado because I love guacamole. In fact, I'm going to name him Avocado Guacamole Skull. 
Jake's actually thinking about that because he loves guacamole, right? You don't do that, do you? Unless you're an artist or an actor or whatever it might be. We don't do that. No one in the history of names has named their kid, you know what, I'm going to name my kid Jezebel. Because we know what she meant in the Bible. No one has named, you know what, I think I'm going to name my son, I'm going to name him Judas. We don't do that, right? Because the name, if you said, hey, this is my friend, and his name is Judas, people are like, whoa, why'd they name him Judas? It's the same thing for Jabez. Everywhere he goes in life. And they introduce him, and his name is Jabez. Everyone sees pain and sorrow, and pain and sorrow. It's not someone you want to be around. It's not someone you want to be with. And yet, he chose to live his life in such a way that he is honorable, knowing that his name means pain, and everyone he's introduced to knows that he brings pain. So it cries out, so in verse 10, Jabez cried out to God, to the God of Israel, and he said this, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Now stop me for a second. When he says, bless me and enlarge my territory, that means he is in a position so that he is some type of leader. He could be a coach. He could be a teacher. He could be a business leader. He could be a business owner. He could be a manager. He could be a landowner at this time. He could be in such a position so that someone is looking to him to lead. Maybe he's leading a club. Maybe he is some part of some kind of community outreach where he's the head guy of it. And so when he turns to God, he's saying, oh, listen, God, you put me in this role, and I'm asking you to expand my territory, enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. In other words, this pain that comes with my name, this pain that is delivered to other people, even though I'm not hurting them, I was named by somebody else, and because of that, I carry this with me wherever I go. This pain that I have that is so excruciating. Would you help me to put it aside, God, and keep me from evil, keep me from harm, so that I might be a reflection of you? What's the pain that you carry? What's the pain that you carry that you haven't given to God? Because you many times and I many times hold on to that, and because of that, I can't live life abundantly because I get stuck in that everyday pain. I want to show my faith to others. I want others to see that faith in me. But I'm an addict. I'm a divorcee. I'm separated. Mom and Dad called me a loser. I made a terrible decision when I was younger and it cares me wherever I go. I'm prideful. I'm arrogant. I'm more about the power than I am about loving people. And so we carry these things with us over and over and over. Or the, the pain may be a physical one. I can't reach out to others because I don't walk very well. I can't reach out to others because I'm still dealing with a loss that I've had. I can't reach out to others because of the sickness that I have. And so because of that, it envelops us and it stops us from reaching people for God. And yet here's Jabez who carried this pain and sorrow with him every single day. And yet in the midst of all the named people, in the midst of John, in the midst of Scott, in the midst of Kelly, in the midst of Rachel, in the midst of Michaela, in the midst of all these people that were sitting there, and all the people that were named, was this one guy who carried this pain and sorrow with him, and he chose to turn and give it to the one person that could take that pain away. And he gave it to God. And he said this to him. All this pain, all this sorrow that carries with me that you see and that everyone else sees. Oh, that you would bless me. In other words, put your hand upon me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Would you turn back to John chapter 9, chapter 10, excuse me. John chapter 10. Verse 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Listen to me. This is very important. Until we realize that the entire focus upon the devil is to take your life. 
and take everything that matters from it until we realize, just like Jabez, that whenever we sin, it not only grieves God, but it grieves us. We will continue every day to die a little more, to be stolen from a little more, and to be destroyed step by step by step. And Jesus never intended that. So in this life, when do you cry out to God? When do you turn to Him and say, Lord, these are the things that I'm struggling with. Would you take them from me? Because in the game of life, it has to start with us loving others. Because that's what Jesus did. There's not a dollar sign attached to it. There's not a payment due. There's not a tax on it. There's not a waiting for the shoe to drop next. There's a promise that we will live life abundantly. And, and I stop here for a second because when people hear that, they're thinking, oh, that means if I just become a Christian, life's going to be perfect. There's no promise to that. Jesus says that in this life, we will have struggles. But we also find out that he uses everything for his good when we choose to recognize him in it. Everything. Everything that comes together can be used for his good. But we have to be careful. Because the thief wants to come at you and wants to take from you and wants to hurt the relationships that mean the most. He wants to dive in and come after your marriage and say, you know what, that whole man and woman thing, yeah, let, let's, let's add something to it. Hey, that whole man and woman thing, listen, everybody at some point gets to the point where, where they can move on to someone else. That's just part of life. It's a midlife crisis. It's time for you to go to start a new life. You're in school, hey, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. Dreams, get, get past them. Because it's time to go out and start to get a job now. And to start working for the rest of your life. Your life, your life. But it takes more from us. Just a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. And know this. That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to steal from you. That word that's in there in the Bible literally means klepto. He wants to take from you and take from you and take from you until there's nothing left to take. Because at that point he's destroyed and he can move on. And Jesus said, I came to give life so that you may live it abundantly. We all have to spin the wheel daily, don't we? We all have to at some point set this game up and spin the wheel. And when we roll it, we're like, okay, where's the next step that I'm taking? I lost my car. Well, here it is. Went off the road. Oh, I'm in a, off a cliff. I'm already dead. Game over. Life over. Taxes are due. Oh, great. One, two, three, four, five. Bought a home gym. Paid $30,000. That's so many jokes. I'll just hold off on that one right now. I bought it. Someone else has to put it together, right? Seven. How about this? Summer school, pay $5,000 per child. That's why you don't have more than four kids. 20 grand, okay? Oh, have a family game night. It's on here. It's a suggestion right in the middle of this game to have a family game night, to invite those that I love together, to come together. Seven. Oh, purple went on this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Family portrait. It's so funny that ends up on it. Guess how much our family portrait costs? A lot. It costs a lot, right? A big family. Thirty-five grand. What? I don't make the game up, right? I just read the rules and I just pay the bills. All that money that was raining down, I'm like, oh, I've got. Two over here and three, and I need, oh, I need another $34,997. We're golden. We don't know what those bills are coming, do they? But it'll be a picture of that family and that portrait that will go up on the wall. And we'll look, and all of a sudden we're like, oh, man, remember how, when, look at that. I was holding that guy. She was in a diaper. And now I've got my arm around her. And now Stella, she's almost as big as you are. And Nate's as big as I am. And Jake's as big as I am. Chandler's bigger than I am. And he's eating a sandwich in the picture. Put that down, Chandler. <laughs> That's the game of life, isn't it? And it goes and it goes and it goes. And every single day we spin the wheel 
and we spin the wheel, and we spin the wheel, we don't know what's coming next. And so we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and oh my goodness, I go to the mailbox, what am I going to get today? The phone rings, who's on the other end? People are stopping by the house, oh, what is it they need now? And so we live defensively, and a little bit of us dies every single day, and Jesus never intended that for any of us. So let's turn it. If we're going to fit all the important things in, let's learn how to turn it. Let's learn so that we spin the wheel. We don't care what comes next. Let's learn so that we walk out the doors. We look forward to the people that we're going to meet today. Let's get to the point of never meeting a stranger. Let's be there and be available to listen. Let's send a text message with joy. Maybe even has a scripture verse in it or something just that's helping you love them. Let's look forward to the customer walking in the door. Let's show a little bit of love to our science teacher, the one that teaches about evolution when I know I believe in creation. Let's put our arms around the people that we love the most and care for the most just to tell them that we love them and we care for them. Because when we dive into those relationships and when we realize that the thief is coming to destroy and when we realize that evil is out there and when we realize that sin means missing the mark and it upsets God, but it's got to get to the point where it upsets me too. So that when I call out, and just as God did for Jabez, it says he answered his request. Because he came to him in sincerity. And he came to him out of love and caring. And it may not have been exactly as Jabez saw, but in the end, he went through the gate. And he was given pasture daily. And God took care of him. Would you challenge yourself this week? And don't wait till tomorrow. To focus upon those loving relationships that God is granting you every single day. To those that you love the most and to those that you've never met. And to start your day by saying, God, I'm going to say a word of prayer. I'm in traffic. I'm in traffic for a reason. It's slowing me down and stop me for a second. Let me, let me focus upon you. I'm walking the hallways. Oh my goodness, I'm two minutes behind. Hey, I'm two minutes behind for a reason. Oh, I forgot my lunch today. And you know what? I've got, I'm in, everyone else is in line. There's that one person over there that no one ever sits next to. I'm going to go over and, and introduce myself just to say hello. Oh, my wife needs something today. You know what? I'm going to be the one rather than wait for her to get back. I'm going to intentionally take this next step and just do this for her because I know it means the world to her. Because this, God would love and it would not grieve him. And this is doing the things that I love and it doesn't grieve me. And through it, moment by moment and relationship by relationship, I start to live life abundantly. Even when the world's beating me down, even when the devil's trying to steal from me and kill me and destroy me, I'm not going to focus on him. I'm going to rest in the words what Jesus shared to me. And I'm going to live this life abundantly. A moment at a time, a spin of the wheel at a time with whatever comes next. Challenge yourself this week. Step one. And next week we'll dive into step two as we continue in this game of life together. Would you stand please and we close the word?